International News Review. Steve Oaken joining us. Good morning, Steve. How are you doing today? I'm great. Good morning, traffic guy, and good morning, Your Excellency. <laughs> do you do you like Neil doing the traffic? Yeah, or like it, so it, many it, of our listeners, would you prefer that I do it because they just can't take it? How, I always, how, how many times do you want your ego massage the one morning? <laughs> How much traffic is there in Singapore at 9 well, on a Saturday, which I've always questioned. Good point. But, I mean, there's, your, there's, Dan the man, there's your ranking right there. Your excellency and the traffic guy. I mean, how much wider could the chasm be on this side of the desk? So, so you're saying if Neil doesn't have to do the traffic because there's not much traffic, that he's just completely superfluous. Is that what you're completely. saying? That's what I'm hearing. Well, I, 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 I'm Give, yeah. give Neil the weather. He can just do, you know, you know, a high in the 30s, humidity, 87%, chance of rain. Well, you've just well, done it, so Steve. That's every weekend. Yeah. So we're, we're just going to cut that clip and run it for the rest of the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. All right, Steve, let's jump right in. we got lots of stuff to talk about. Let's talk, uh, let's go first with uh, Djokovic, right? Uh, his visa's been denied twice. He's expected to be remanded back into uh, the uh, uh the federal um, detention area. He is this afternoon. Yeah. It, yep. And they're expecting to meet the court, uh, go back to court tomorrow. But if we look broad, more broadly, what does this say about the future of VVIPs coming into any country for any event or business people, sporting stars, uh, whoever, what, where, where well, are we going with all this? Yeah. And I can say on the narrow and then we can expand, expand broader. But Djokovic should have left the country. He, he knows what is coming. And I think he had every right to apply for that exemption because the Australians gave him that right. He had every right to expect that it would have been met. But the minute it became so political, the minute it became clear the Australians were going to kick him out no matter what because it was in the government's interest to kick him out, Djokovic should have just taken the high road at that point yeah. and said, look, I'm out. I can't win. Now he's in a position of fighting a legal case. He is almost certainly going to lose with the potential consequence that he's out of Australia for the next three years. I mean, literally mm -hmm. half of his grand slams, the nine out of the 20, have come from the Australian Open. And he has put at risk the ability to compete in his best tournament by far for the next three years, and he's at an age where every chance he gets to win a tournament could be, you know, it, it, it diminishes an opportunity. So he is making a terrible judgment here, um, and it's because the public is fed up uh, with with inconsistencies, with arbitrariness, with with the appearance that people get treated better. Some people get treated better than others, and that's where we're headed. Isn't this one of those rare stories, Steve, where every involved party is wrong you know normally we like things to be very binary there's a right and a wrong mm -hmm. there's a left and a right a red and a blue but in this particular case you could make a real argument that everybody was wrong Djokovic shouldn't have come in the first place the Victorian government shouldn't have given him an exemption the federal government should have reacted sooner and so on and so on I mean where do you stand overall now on this you know, I mean, well, look, you have to take it step by step by step. And and the first step, I, you know, Djokovic shouldn't have, have lied. Um, and I think that when you are not subject to the scrutiny and is great in, in as much a, a tennis player and as much, you know, popularity as Djokovic has, when you start digging into somebody's existence day by day by day, especially with all of the social media that's posted, somebody's yeah. going to say something that turns out not to be the case. Um, and then that is clearly what happened with Djokovic. Where was he? Did he travel? Did, when did he test positive? What did he do after he get tested positive? This is all going to fall apart on him. Mm. Okay, I'll get say maybe he shouldn't have, have been thinking about that. But the minute he was under the microscope, he should have left. So he made the, the, the first mistake was the Australians saying we're going to give an exemption when, when they weren't going to give one. The second was he is trying to keep it when he had lied and he knew he had lied and there were a, a multiple evidence that he lied. Now, wait, with, wasn't uh, it his agent? His agent filled in the form wrong, ticked the wrong box. <laughs> no, okay. It, okay. Throw the agent under no, the bus. <laughs> no, but Djokovic lied because he knew he had COVID and he did not follow the rules in Serbia. He knew he had COVID and he did that interview uh, unmasked with 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 that journalist back in you know December I think it was 17th or 18th uh, when he had already tested positive for COVID. So Djokovic had lied. His agent had lied. The Australian government sets up a 
a process that they were never going to honor when a bit, when the political uh, heat got too hot. So everybody, as you say, Neil, looked bad, and everybody could have course corrected along the way. Um, and now it's Djokovic's chance to course correct, and he didn't take it. And instead, his lawyers filed a 260 page, a 268 page affidavit of why it's in the public interest for him to stay in Australia. Well, that's ridiculous. It's not their call as to what's in the public interest for Australia. It's the Australian. Right. Show. Right, of course. But this ties in with a very enjoyable and sometimes heated discussion that you and I had at an Indian restaurant this week about VVIPs, as Glenn mentioned. Should they be given forms of exemptions, whether they are medical, political, economic, whatever? If someone is proven to have an economic benefit, a discernible economic benefit for a country, should that VVIP get some form of exemption? That's the larger question here, isn't it, Steve? Yeah, look, and, and let you know, take a look. You know, take a look at Singapore. You know, there's there's probably close to half a million people here unvaccinated. Take a take a look at in Australia. There's millions of Australians, at least a couple million probably Australians who are unvaccinated. So, are you going to allow one additional person in who is who is unvaccinated um, if they follow certain rules? And the you can either say yes or no, and you could have the judgment that because of the impact that person brings, it could be economic impact that they're going to create jobs and, and invest in the country. It could be that there's an impact because it's going to bring more revenue to the country because you're playing mm. in a tennis tournament and you're going to get a bigger draw. It could be for you know, that you're an artist and you're going to bring joy to people, and, and so you're going to have that type of impact for the people who are going to come in. So you make that decision that we are going to allow unvaccinated because there's unvaccinated. It's not illegal to be unvaccinated in Singapore, in Australia, in the United States or anywhere else. So why is it hurt to have another unvaccinated person come in if they follow proper protocols and there is a discernible, a discernible benefit to that country? I think a, a government could easily make that argument if it did so in a transparent way not the way yeah. that it's been done here mm, it's well a potential minefield though isn't it and and with an election year coming up yeah. in australia and with all of the you know as we all know all politics is local and it has never shown its uh it's uh, truth more than uh, than now in Australia. Uh, yeah. Let's go to another very political moment that we're seeing take place uh, thousands of miles away. The Bojo woes. Uh, Boris Johnson being asked to resign by members of his own party, by obviously by the opposition. The question and answer time this week was just brilliant. Uh, any of you who saw those clips on YouTube and elsewhere, uh, he was just savaged all week for these Downing Street parties, and even though he didn't even attend them. Some of them. Some of them. Apparently. Yes. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the, the, the question here is, is, is hypocrisy now uh, a, a limiting factor on your ability to stay in power? It used to be. <laughs> really? It, it used to be. No, absolutely. I, I think it's no, a time-honored tradition. It's a time-honored no. tradition going back thousands of years. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, but, it, you know, but there were lines you could not cross. And we'll go back to an American example. Right? Bill Clinton gets impeached basically for having an affair, right? Now, he doesn't yeah. get convicted, so he stays in office. And then Newt Gingrich who was the leader of the Republicans to impeach him, was found to have been engaging in an affair while he was, right, while he, while he was, you know, saying Bill Clinton the office. Gingrich had yeah. to resign. The next person, the next highest Republican, also having an affair, who was going after <laughs> Clinton, he had to resign. So hypocrisy cost the Republicans there. Would that happen mm. today? Would hypocrisy cost the Republicans today? Is hypocrisy going to cost Bojo, where the rules apply to one? But not the other. Do as I say, uh, not as I do. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, I, I, I would hope that this level of hypocrisy um, is going to cost you your office if, if you are going to be governing on that. But it, it yeah. looks like there's a bigger political question. I kind of leave this political question to Neil. Um, you know, the, 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 the conservative party has to answer the question, are we better off or worse off? With, with Johnson, if there's no better replacement, you keep him despite the hypocrisy, which shows that hypocrisy is no longer a, a limiting factor to, to rule anymore. Yeah, and that's, that's the key point. Steve and I joke about this, but really, if you've seen the HBO series of Succession, you will know how this is going to play out in the UK government. The Tory party has been considered the natural party of government for the best part of 300 years for one key reason. They are ruthless when it comes to stabbing their own in the back, in the mm. way that liberals and Democrats never are. Mm. They did it to Margaret Thatcher <laughs> after she won three elections. They did it to Theresa May more recently. You know, history has shown 
that will be the discerning factor as deciding factors, as uh, Steve mentions. They don't care about scandal. They don't care about sleaze. They don't care about polls and lack of popularity. If they think this man cannot win them the next election and preserve their seats in Parliament, he will go and he will yeah. go soon. And that will settle it. Yeah. All other concerns are secondary to that. Yeah. Uh, Steve, we also are watching uh, Prince Andrew now being dist further distanced. Well, uh, from, just Andrew now. From, yeah, Andrew yeah, Andrew. yeah, From the Royals uh, because of his ongoing... Um, uh, sc scandal involving uh, pedophilia. Um, the the royals are well, you know, it is what it is, I guess. But they are they are really uh, talk about being brutally like clear about what they want to stand for and what they don't want to stand for. Uh, he's he's in the crosshairs. And I, I saw I saw this week where one of the uh, veterans groups uh, had written a very strong statement. They like they want him out of the military absolutely because he does not represent their values. And just to add to that, Steve, before you jump in. I think there's an American component to this because I can't help feeling that the royal family have a sense of what's coming down the track from America in these tough civil courts. What do you think? Well, first, I, I kind of think it's a little bit funny that we can call Glenn your excellency, but we can't call Andrew your excellency. So, Glenn. <laughs> now, uh, governor, now, just call me uh, governor. <laughs> and the thing about... I, look, I'm going, to, I'm going to equate Andrew to Djokovic. I'm not sure any show has done this yet, right? But it is very clear. You could be the first. I could be the, it was very clear what was going to ha happen to Andrew. We know Djokovic was going to get kicked out of Australia. He should have just left on his own. Andrew should have just said, you know what, I'm stepping back. Here are the gobs of titles I have. I mean, he's the honorary air commander of the RAF Lucy Mouth, or I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. He's a colonel in chief of the Small Arms School Corp. He is a colonel in chief of the Royal Lancers. He's a colonel in chief of the Yorkshire Regiment, and on and on and on. God knows what all these 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 <laughs> titles, you know, they're meaningless, of course. Um, he had a number of overseas military honorary chests. You know, why did he keep them? Just give them back. Say, look, I've got to focus on clearing my name. He has he has mm. denied even meeting the woman, even though we've seen the pictures of her, him in Virginia. Armor under her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's denied with you know with, 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 with Giselle in the background. He's denied ever even meeting her. She has yeah. said he has sexually she has said he has sexually assaulted her on three occasions when she was under the age of 18. He should have just given all of this back and said, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna I'm gonna concentrate on clearing my name. I'm gonna concentrate on on, on doing what's right, making sure the truth comes out, blah, 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 blah. So he now has to get, you know, William come in and have a private meeting with the Queen and the, his Royal Highness title gets taken away formally. He's just, he is a disaster from a public affairs perspective. Is say, and, and, and he's only making it worse for himself. And very briefly, he was supposed to have been in a pizza express, a pizza <laughs> restaurant on the night in a, a place called Woking, which is just outside of London. But no one remembers him being there, not the staff, <laughs> the customers. Now, I the paparazzi. <laughs> as you both know, I am personal friends with Prince William, having met him for five seconds at Marina Bay. And the Queen. <laughs> and the Queen, who I saw from 100 metres away, <laughs> top high. <laughs> I've never forgotten that moment. Of course. I've met Tony Blair and never forgotten it. I've met Muhammad Ali and never forgotten it. I'd like to think if I was having, you know, a margarita pizza next to Prince Andrew, I might remember it. <laughs> Apparently, nobody has any recollection of this man being there. And I would imagine not much happens in Woking of this caliber. So people there would have certainly remembered it, right? No, no, yeah. not, not much. You know what, Neil? You know, I Neil, I bet you remember being in the studio this close to a governor for the rest of your life. I mean, so this is something that God, nah. you. I'm having him talking Cockney by oh. the end of the class and doing Dick Van Dyke, Mary Poppins, oh. governor. Please, yes, sir, more food, more yeah. porridge. Yeah. You've got that it's Mr. Bumble. You've got that Mr. Bumble, Oliver Twist vibe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Finally, yeah. North Korea launched at least seven attacks on cryptocurrency platforms that extracted nearly $400 million worth of digital assets last year. Uh, this report is just coming out. Now, uh, you know, I, some, of our, some of our listeners may be trading in crypto. I, I just started trading in crypto on the 31st of December. We haven't talked about this yet, Neil. I don't even understand I it. just started <laughs> investing in cryptocurrencies. My portfolio is up 30%. Wow. 30% since I started doing it in December. Now, of course, what can go up comes down. So I'm interested in this, and I, and I think uh, probably some of our, our listeners are interested as well. Um, 
again, North Koreans involved in hacking, right, Steve? I mean, this is not a new story necessarily, but the numbers are big. Well, the numbers are big, and I mean, I think this this illustrates three different thematics that are that you really need to be aware of right now. Certainly, if you're in the in the crypto space, one is um, from a government regulatory perspective, because these types of things can happen. Our government's going to allow cryptocurrency to continue, or are they going to to shut them down, or much more heavily regulate them, which could really bring the price down because they because they are free from from any government. You now can get a, a, a you know a regime like North Korea stealing hundreds of millions of dollars to be used to fund uh, its its nuclear missiles, um, and that's something that that governments are not going to want to allow to happen. So you have the increased chance for government regulation um, because of something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're an investor, um, you're you can get hacked anytime. Um, and so what's going to happen, you know, when your money gets stolen from a bank, you, you, that's insured, your money gets stolen off your laptop, that's gone forever. So what yeah. do you do to protect yourself from, uh, from, from cyber theft? Um, and then the other issue around crypto, of course, is that it's terrible for the environment because it, it requires so mm. much energy, uh, to, to generate, you know, these long, 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 long lines of, uh, to go into the Coach, so I think there's still a lot of risk. It's why I'm with Neil. Um, I don't know if it's from a public affairs perspective or we're just troglodytes that we don't touch cryptocurrency. But, but then again, we're not up 30% in about two weeks. No, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll, well, I mean, on behalf of our governing uh, billionaire crypto mm. investor over here, should he be worried? I mean, is this it for, for a benefit of our listeners who do invest in crypto, even though I have no idea what it is, um, should they be concerned? No, I mean, I think you should. I mean, I think you need to to see that there's a lot of upside on crypto. There's reasons to have it. There's a lot of uh, you know opportunities in terms of you know, lessening transaction costs and and more security. I mean, so there are obviously huge upsides and benefits to crypto, but then there's also downsides. I I don't know that the downsides are thought of as much. You certainly should probably not put all of your assets into into crypto because there. Oh, is like a any lot portfolio, you want to spread it around. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, but the, 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 there is a lot of risk here, but there's a lot of reward here. And that's why, you know, so many people are, are in it. And there's reasons for it to, to happen, especially um, uh, in terms. And there's a lot of good benefits from it, from an ESG perspective. There's the downside, but there's the upsides. You can track things through the supply chain. I mean, if you can use, not crypto, but when you talk about blockchain and the technologies yeah. that go with that, you can make sure that, that you don't use forced labor and slave labor uh, in the yeah. supply chain, that you're not getting palm oil from 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 forests in Indonesia that have been you know clear cut yep. and, and where the, the peak and that your fish so, your fish is coming from where that say they say it's coming from etc sustainable right? you have to move your portfolio around I put some of my money under my bed I put some of it <laughs> under my daughter's bed don't tell me I'm not moving with the times now moving with the times briefly finally I must ask you so you are voting for Big Bird at the next election are you I see that wonderful T-shirt you've got on there my friend. Yeah, that's well. Bennett brought this back for me from from the U.S. You know, Big Bird is taking on Ted Cruz uh, in in Texas, and so uh, his campaign is is up and running. They're selling T-shirts. He's all over Twitter. So so we're really going to see what can happen in in the Senate race because boy, I know we'll talk about this through you know, later on in the year. It's a huge complication of what's going to happen with COVID, with inflation, um, with the political dysfunction we have, and so candidates like Big Bird, you can really get behind. Um, who stand for something, uh, and and we can hope we can we can come together as a country. Around a, <laughs> I, I vote for a, Sesame a, a Street. Big yellow bird. <laughs> they're they're, they're right. pro family, pro education, <laughs> pro learning. What's not to like? Vote Sesame there Street. There you go. Always dress as well. Okay. Always dress as well. <laughs> we are going to leave it there. Steve, thank you so much for being with us today. International News Review. Steve Oaken. We'll see you next week, buddy. Thank you, Governor. <laughs>